Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You know, I believe that we always find time to do the things that we really, really want to do. We find time to eat. We find time to entertain ourselves. We find time to go shopping and buy things. So why do we have so much trouble finding time to spend with God? I have answers for you today on enjoying everyday life. I think anything can become a God to us. Anything that we worship, anything that we put an excessive amount of time into, especially if it's something that takes us away from the run, one true God, becomes a false God that we worship and bow down to. I even think that people can let their feelings become a God. You say, what do you mean to that? Well, are you bowing to the Word of God or to your feelings? Are your feelings controlling you and giving you direction all the time? Or are you able to say, I don't care how I feel, this is what I bow to. I don't bow to anything else. Let's remember for a moment that in Luke 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and during that time he was being tempted by the devil. We will be tempted. Temptation must come. There's no one here that can avoid temptation. You will never get so spiritual that you will not have temptation. But the enemy said to Jesus, if you will bow down to me just this once, you have to understand that the enemy is always trying to get us to bow to his will, to his ways. And I really believe that in the world that we live in today, there are so many distractions. And actually, we have a huge problem with concentration. And it's been designed by the enemy. For many people, it is very difficult and almost frustrating to try to pray because they cannot keep their mind on what they're doing for more than maybe 30 seconds. And I have to admit that quite often I fight that battle myself, and it's one of my prayers that God would give me a greater ability to concentrate. No doubt when I say to you, keep God first in your life, there are many other things that are going to be clamoring for your attention. We are probably the busiest people on the face of the earth. I don't know what it is we think we're doing, but we're busy about it. Most of you at the end of most days couldn't even say what you've accomplished, but you know that you're very frustrated <laughs> because you were busy all day and it seems that you got nothing done. The Bible says, looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So I think it is very right and very timely and appropriate for me to take some time, not only for you here, but for all the people that watch around the world saying, you have to form a habit of keeping God first in everything, first in your thoughts, your conversation, your time, your finances. You can be as close to God as you want to be. It just depends on how much time you're willing to put into it. Do not look at someone else who has a great, close, intimate relationship with God that hears from God and knows the Word of God and say, well, I wish I had that kind of relationship with God. They did not get it wishing. I don't even know how to tell you how thankful I am for what I know. But it's taken 32 years of diligently studying the Word to know what I know. You can know it too. You think, 32 years. <laughs> what else do you have to do? <laughs> I mean, really, what else do you have to do that's going to produce this kind of result in your life? So, once again this morning, I'm going to hammer the value of spending time with God. James 4, 4 and 5. You are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's don't read it so fast we miss it. 
and breaking your marriage vow to God. Now, I would hope if I was having an affair with someone else, my husband would be jealous. <laughs> but God is your true spiritual husband. He's my spiritual husband, and he does not appreciate it when we spend more time with other things than we do with him. Amen? You're like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being, a God, is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. You can't live with one foot in the world and one in the kingdom and hope it's going to work. That's called lukewarm Christianity. And Revelation says, I would rather you be hot or cold, for if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And I think we all know there's way too much compromise today, way too much watered-down Christianity and commitment to God. And I believe if we are going to serve God, then we need to do it with our whole heart, and we need to do it zealously and passionately and fervently. Amen? Do you suppose that the Scripture is speaking to no purpose that says, The Spirit whom He has caused to dwell in us yearns over us, and He yearns for the Spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. <laughs> God is actually jealous, not in the way that we think of jealousy, not in a wrong kind of jealousy, but He very much wants your attention. <laughs> he wants you to care more about him than anybody. He wants you to talk to him more than anybody. He wants you to lean on him, trust in him more than you do anything else. Now, the next verse of Scripture that I'm going to read you was one of those defining verses of Scripture in my life. I was thinking this morning, probably I should do a series sometime on maybe like the 10 Scriptures that have been the most life-changing for me. We love all of the Word, but you know that we have those ones that just are like wow, wow, double, triple wow to us. <laughs> that is just like, man. And I must tell you that when I came to understanding this next verse I'm going to read you, I was the most frustrated Christian that any Christian could have ever been. Not only did I know that I needed to spend more time with God, I struggled trying to do it, and somehow or another I couldn't seem to get Him in the place I couldn't seem to give him the place that he needed. I just was not happy. I was under condemnation a lot. I mean, I was already teaching the Word, and I, I knew things that I was still having a difficult time getting them to work in my life, and I tried so hard. I mean, my goodness, I tried and tried. I tried until I almost died. Sincere Christians do that. They try and they try and they try and they get more and more confused because they don't understand why it is that the harder they try, the more ridiculous they behave. <laughs> Amen? You know how we are. We lay in bed and have our plan for holiness for the day. <laughs> and it lasts until we put our feet on the floor. <laughs> Amen? Now remember, he's saying, okay, you're like unfaithful wives, have an illicit love affair with the world. You're putting all this stuff ahead of me. I don't like it. Now, here comes the answer. But, I love the buts of God in the Bible. You know, it's like the Bible says that Joseph's brothers hated him, but God gave him favor. But he gives us more and more grace. Now, I had heard a lot about grace through my years as a Christian. I heard about grace when I was even in the denominational church that I was part of for a long time, I got a great foundation about the grace of God. We need to know what the grace of God is. I'd heard a definition that it was God's undeserved favor, which it is. But the Amplified Bible, I thank God for the Amplified Bible because I would never be a Greek student nor a Hebrew student. I am just like, I got to keep it simple. I'm still working on reading English. I don't have time to get into. <laughs> so I need a little help. How many of you need a little help sometimes, okay? I admire these people that have got a string of letters behind their name that mean they're really smart. 
you know. But even if you don't have those, you do have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Come on. I said you've got the Holy Spirit. I'd heard more of the doctrinal side of grace rather than the practical side of grace. I, I want to paint this picture that I was about as frustrated as anybody could get. I'm sure there's some people in here today that you are in a place right now where I was at when I read this. So he says, God gives us more and more grace. And then here's what the Amplified says. Power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. <laughs> I mean, when I read that, God did something in me. Grace is not just undeserved favor. It's not just the thing that saves us. But grace is the power of the Holy Spirit to enable me to have victory over everything that is not right in my life. Grace is the absolute most wonderful, most powerful message. And grace is not an excuse to sin. It's the power not to have to. See, some people, I think, teach the grace message out of balance. Well, no matter what you do, there's always grace. Well, yeah. I'm not going to deny that. But grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy half-hearted, compromising life and think you can get by with it because of the love, the grace, and the mercy of God. Grace is available every day to help us overcome. And it's by the grace of God that you can defeat bad habits and make good habits. Amen? Now, he's saying here that, I mean, let, let's just put it like maybe if Paul was here preaching to you guys today. It might go something like this. Now, listen, guys you got to start putting God first because God is a jealous God and he really just doesn't like all these affairs that you're having with everything else besides him. You're in the world, but you're not of the world and you have to really keep God in the right place. He's a jealous God. He doesn't like it, but God will give us grace and more grace. To overcome this evil tendency to put everything ahead of God. So I don't even have to try to overcome this on my own. I go to God and say, I know I need to spend time with you. I know I need to get out of bed. I know I need to put you before the television, before the, the sports games, before shopping. I know I need to put you first in my life. But God, I am having such a hard time with this. Help me. Give me grace, grace, and more grace. Well, I taught a series years ago called Grace, Grace, and More Grace, and it be quickly became one of my most popular teaching series because if you do not understand the grace of God, there is no way that you can ever live any way other than frustrated because you will go to church and hear what you should do, you will go home and try to do it, and you will fail because God only helps the humble. He only helps those, he only gives grace to the humble. The Bible says in Proverbs 34 and also in 1 Peter 5. He frustrates, he, he, God himself frustrates, defeats, and opposes the proud. God, I thought the devil was frustrating me. I thought Dave was frustrating me. I thought my kids were frustrating me. And here I find out in 1 Peter 5 that it's God that's frustrating me. <laughs> and that it's God that is hindering me and not allowing my plans to work out. Come on now. Let's go deeper today. It was God himself that was not letting my trying Why? Because he never asked me to try. He asked me to believe and lean and trust. That doesn't mean that there's no effort that we put out, but you cannot do it apart from him, and he will not let you succeed if you try to. 
Okay. Let me show you a little example that maybe will help. 1 Peter 5.10. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, oh, I love this, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be. <laughs> Woo! We ought to go back to dancing. We should be a dancing generation if we really understand this. God will complete you and make you what you ought to be. He wants me to want what's right with all my heart. He wants me to be so hungry for righteousness. We've been given righteousness, right standing with God at the new birth, but he says, now put it on. Put on righteousness. And that means that we let that righteousness that God has given us be worked into us and out through us in our behavior, in the way we talk, in the way we think, in the way we handle our money, in our entertainment, in the way we dress, into all of our relationships. God loves people who love righteousness. But you can love righteousness and still not be able to pull it off if you don't lean on God and His grace. Now, let me tell you what grace is. Grace is certainly undeserved favor. This is a definition that I've kind of put together, but I think it's accurate. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit coming to us free of charge to enable us to do with ease what we could never do on our own with any amount of struggle and effort. You want it one more time? Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit coming to us free of charge. It's a free gift. <laughs> the only thing you can do to get grace is ask for it. <laughs> it's power. It's not just undeserved favor, but it's power. <laughs> power. <laughs> That's why when we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we receive power. I love that word power. I don't like the word weak. I like power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit coming to you free of charge to enable you to do with ease what you could never do on your own with any amount of struggle and effort. I would imagine that trying to run this ministry would kill me in about seven days were it not for the grace of God and the prayers of the saints. Honestly and truly. It would just do me in. God will give you grace to raise your children. He will give you grace to be in a marriage that's less than perfect. And when you have the grace for something, you don't have to murmur all the way through it and be depressed all the way through it and be despondent all the way through it and discouraged all the way through it. You can do it with joy and a good attitude. And you can say, God, if this is where you've got me, then give me the grace to do it with dignity. I'm tired of Christians ruining God's reputation by putting bumper stickers all over their car and then acting like idiots. Come on. When we're leaving this parking lot today, don't you dare try to run me over. Until, of course, you notice it's me. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've had that. Like, eh, oh. <laughs> you man pleaser, you. <laughs> we should do everything we do unto God. Treat all people with respect and dignity. After you've suffered a little while. Well, I wish that wasn't there. <laughs> After you've suffered a little while, then God will come along and give you grace. Okay, why, what's with the suffering thing? <laughs> I th this is what I believe God has shown me. From the time I discover through the Word that I'm doing something wrong, if I really have a right heart to God, 
it's going to really bug me that I'm not what I need to be. And there's going to be a type of suffering, a suffering in the flesh, a frustration that I can't pull it off. And as long as I'm trying to do it on my own, believe me, I'm going to suffer. I believe the victory comes when we say, you know what, God, I want to do this, but I can't do it without you. And you see, the truth of the matter is, is if God did let you do it without him, then you would get the credit, not him. And God will not share his glory with anybody. Start every day on your knees. Even better than that, if your body will put up with it, get on your face. Stretch out before God and say, I'm helpless without you, God. I don't care if you're getting ready to go do something that you've done successfully 1,000 times. Don't be presumptuous and think that you can do it again. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, I'll be honest and tell you that I'm standing up here this morning and I feel like my belly's full of fire. Because I know, I know, I know that I know that I know. If you will make a decision that you will not do without having God first in your life, that whatever it takes, you are going to pray it through, you are going to seek God until you put Him first. I know that that changes everything in your life. It changes everything in your life. I don't care how many seminars you go to, how many CDs you have, it's all great information and you need it. I'm not saying don't do that. Thank God you're here. But you know what? You still better take this home and say, boy, God, I mean, I heard a lot this weekend. Matter of fact, I don't even remember most of it. <laughs> so, first of all, Holy Spirit, I'm depending on you to bring it back to my remembrance. Because that's one of the things he says he'll do for you. Boy, I'd be in bad shape up here without the Holy Spirit. It is unbelievable the things that he brings to my remembrance when I'm preaching. I say things I don't even know. You do. It's like, oh, that was good. I better go back and listen to that later. I mean, honestly, it's like, it's like God is orchestrating some kind of a, a ballet. or a, it's, it's like he just brings things to your remembrance and he orchestrates it and puts it together in such a way that it actually helps people. The Holy Spirit is the most wonderful blessing. Jesus said, you're going to be better off when I go away. What a statement. You will be better off when I go away because when I leave, I will send you another comforter. Don't expect the world to comfort you. Even if they want to, they don't know how to. Come on, we can, we can try to let God flow through us to comfort people. But even somebody who's trying to comfort another person, you better go to God to ask Him to help you do it. He will send us a comforter, a helper, a strengthener, an advocate. One who pleads our case in the court of justice. An intercessor. One who not only prays for us, but teaches us how to pray as we ought to. And in case all the rest of those don't work, he's our standby. We need to focus more on the Holy Spirit. Recently, I purchased about 10 books on the Holy Spirit. And I thought, I'm going to refresh myself in all these areas because I want to be sure that I'm very aware of the holy presence of God in my life and the power that's available to me to help me live and behave in a way that will bring glory to God. Let's have a moment of truth. You know, if we're too busy to spend regular time seeking God, then I think we're really just too busy 
with a lot of things that really probably don't make that much difference because we should always manage our lives in such a way that we have good quality time for God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 that physical training is of some value, but godliness is useful and valuable in everything and in every way. 